Shortly after dawn, on Monday, February 21st, 1916, French soldiers in a quiet sector of the Western Front near Verdun were put on the alert, as was the daily routine. They peered out across to the German trenches, but could detect no activity. Suddenly, 1,220 German guns exploded with fire along a line of eight miles. It was the greatest bombardment so far on the Western Front. The barrage opened one of the most prolonged and agonizing struggles of World War I. After nearly two years on the defensive, the German army rose up to attack. The future of France and the war hung in the balance. The German commander, General Erich von Falkenhayn, planned to wage a limited offensive. But it would devour almost a million men. Henri-Philippe Pétain, Verdun's commander at the height of the battle, would forever be associated with its defense. He symbolized France's struggle for survival. Verdun would see a confrontation between Generals Pétain and Falkenhayn in one of the most notorious battles in history. In August 1914, trench warfare and a stalemate on the Western Front disillusioned the Allies and Germany. The war would prove to be long and brutal. During 1915, Germany focused on defeating Russia. At the same time, they had to defend against France and Britain. The French and British made several unsuccessful attempts to break through the Western Front. Believing that artillery was the key to victory, heavier guns were used for the attacks, but they could never breach the front. The Germans had successes against Russia in the early years of the war, but its leaders knew that true victory could only come from the West. Both the Germans and the Allies planned for a decisive victory in 1916. For Henri Pétain and Erich von Falkenhayn, 1916 would be a year of destiny. Their long and distinguished careers would lead them to direct confrontation at Verdun. Erich von Falkenhayn was from an aristocratic but poor family with a strong military tradition. Thanks to Kaiser Wilhelm's patronage, he quickly rose through the military. The Kaiser had been particularly impressed by von Falkenhayn's reports when he was the liaison officer in China during the Boxer Rebellion of 1900. He succeeded General Helmut von Moltke as the German army's head in September 1914. This was just as the invasion of France was brought to a halt by the Allies. Falkenhayn was a withdrawn and unpopular figure, two traits which did not make a good leader. On the one hand, he was able to restore the German army's fighting power after its failure to overcome the French and British in the first few weeks of the war. On the other, he had enraged Generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff by his hesitancy on the Eastern Front, halting the German offensive just as a decisive victory seemed within reach. <laughs> 
His wavering would be a significant factor in Falkenhayn's handling of the battle to come. Henri Philippe Pétain was from a more humble family. After 36 years in the French army, he was near retirement when the war broke out. Prior to World War I, he had only commanded an infantry regiment. Patin also served as a professor of tactics at the French War School. In his lectures, he opposed the French military doctrine of the time, which was based entirely on offensive strategies. Patin felt that modern military technology, with its quick firing, accurate artillery and machine guns, would prove too much for the French soldier under attack. Instead, he advocated the use of overwhelming firepower to support the infantrymen in both attack and defense. Patin's views were often ridiculed. But his predictions would prove true during the disastrous attacks on France in 1914 and 1915. By the end of these costly battles, he was promoted. In July 1915, he was commanding the French Second Army. Unlike his German counterpart, Falkenhayn, Patin was held in high esteem by ordinary French soldiers. He was considered a soldier's general. Falkenhayn and Patin's personalities could not be more different. Yet both would soon be pitted against each other in a confrontation that would decide the course of the war. The French and British leaders met in December 1915 to discuss plans for a major offensive in the coming year. Soon after, General Joseph Joffre, the French commander, wrote to the British general, Sir Douglas Haig. He suggested the British and French attack side by side across the River Somme, the boundary between the two armies. Joffre was convinced that he could achieve the decisive breakthrough that would bring the war to an end. Douglas Haig preferred a British offensive further north in Flanders, but recognizing that Joffre was regarded as the Allied commander-in-chief, he agreed. The joint attack on the Somme was planned for July. The massive amount of artillery which the two commanders intended to deploy for the attack echoed Patan's doctrine of firepower. General Erich von Falkenhayn was confident that the strength of the German defenses would hold any major Allied attack. But he realized that this strategy would not win the war. His armies would have to attack in the west. Falkenhayn conceived a diabolical way for Germany to break the deadlock. He regarded Britain as the arch enemy with France as their sword on the continent. He needed a method to knock that sword out of Britain's hand and end the war. Falkenhayn believed that the French were close to moral and military collapse. In January 1916, he told the Kaiser that he noticed the ever-dwindling power of the resistance and limited ability of the French people to hold out. Falkenhayn concluded that if France fell, Russia would follow suit and Britain isolated would concede. The events of 1915 had been enough to deter Falkenhayn from attempting a mass breakthrough. Instead, he planned a limited offensive against a sector of the French line. Verdun would be the place. A traditional fortress city Verdun lies across the River Meuse and has long symbolized French national courage and pride. 
It was built under the guidance of King Louis XIV's famous architect, Vauban. For over 200 years, it withstood invasion, including a failed German attempt in 1914. Until then, Verdun had been closely protected by outlying forts and was a relatively quiet sector of the front. Now, it was to be Falkenhayn's killing ground, where he would force the French to defend at all costs. He declared, here the forces of France will be bled to death. Germans saw Verdun as the heart of France and knew that an attack there would be devastating. The Kaiser's son, Crown Prince Wilhelm, and his fifth army would carry out the attack. But from the outset, there was friction between him, his tough chief of staff, General Knobelsdorf, and General von Falkenhayn. The Crown Prince's main objective was to capture Verdun. He pressed for simultaneous attacks against the weakened French defenses on both sides of the River Meuse. Falkenhayn overrode the Crown Prince, insisting on limiting the offensive to the right bank only, a frontage of less than 10 miles. Falkenhayn's agenda was to completely wipe out the French army, bleeding France white, as he termed it. He knew this strategy would result in heavy German casualties. He feared opposition from his battlefield commanders and was reluctant to divulge his plan. The German 5th Army prepared for battle. Troops, ammunition, and guns of every caliber were brought up the line in great secrecy. Zero day was set for February 12th. Poor weather would eventually delay the opening of the attack until the 21st. French General Noël de Castelnau commanded the Verdun sector. The city was surrounded by hills and ridges that provided superb defensive positions. On the heights themselves, three concentric rings of forts were built, their guns placed to fend off infantry attacks. The forts were the crowning glory of the French defensive layout. The strongest of these was Fort Duamont, which had been designed to resist the heaviest shells. An elaborate telephone system controlled the fort's guns. These were mounted in turrets and consisted of one 155 mm, one 75 mm, and three heavy machine guns. The fort could accommodate a full battalion of 1,000 infantrymen. A series of underground passages linked each gun emplacement. Each of the Verdun forts was designed to hold out on its own for weeks at a time. They lay between five and 10 miles from the city. They were covered by a protective network of trenches, redoubts, and thick belts of barbed wire. But since the autumn of 1914, these defenses had been badly neglected and many guns removed for use in other more active sectors. The relative inactivity on both sides had given the garrison a false sense of security Many of the forts, including Duamont, were also undermanned. The French troops dropped their guard. Lieutenant Colonel Emile Driant, a regimental commander, was unhappy about the situation 
Throughout 1915, he watched standards decline in the garrison. He was concerned that Verdun would be defenseless against a sustained German attack and pestered influential friends until the French defense ministry took action. They sent a commission to inspect Verdun. It recommended that urgent steps be taken to improve the defenses. Henri Pétain, commanding the French Second Army well to the north, became aware of the situation, but he was occupied guarding the Champagne region and had little time to think about Verdun. Falkenhayn continued his preparations for the German offensive. By the end of January 1916, the French realized that a German attack was likely and that Verdun was the main objective. At the last minute, Joffre ordered two French infantry divisions to reinforce the Verdun sector. Pétain and other senior French commanders turned their eyes anxiously toward France's premier fortress. The defenders of Verdun struggled frantically to improve their positions in a desperate race against time. The French soldiers of World War I were known as the poilus, or hairy ones, for their preference of mustaches and beards. They dreaded the thought of digging in. They were even unhappier with building elaborate trench and dugout systems around the forts that made up Verdun's defenses. Cold, wet conditions in early 1916 made life miserable for French soldiers on the front line at Verdun. The only thing that they could take relief in was knowing they were in a quiet sector. Apathy would also have its consequences for the French defenders of Verdun. The trenches in the forward zone of the defense were poorly prepared compared to the deep, concreted German dugouts. The German front line itself curved around Verdun on either side of the River Meuse. On high ground, it overlooked the city and its forts. The German defenses were both well-positioned and formidable. Falkenhayn's men reinforced concrete bunkers and underground shelters for their headquarters, communication centers, medical facilities, ammunition stores, and accommodation for the men. Behind the front line, Falkenhayn arranged for narrow-gauge railways to help in the movement of the extra ammunition and supplies needed for the attack. As January passed into February, the French troops were at last spurred into action, thanks to the warnings of Colonel Drion and the undeniable sign of German preparations for an attack. The reinforcements that Joffre had for Verdun were rushed into the line. The future of Verdun rested heavily on how much the French army would trust Henri Pétain's belief in overwhelming firepower. In the meantime, they steeled themselves for the inevitable attack. One wrote, we all pray to God that we are not too late with our preparations to meet the enemy. All they could do now was watch and wait for the German storm to break. Poised to assault Verdun, Crown Prince Wilhelm's Fifth Army had faith in their commander, but were suspicious and hostile toward Commander-in-Chief Falkenhayn and his staff. <laughs> 
One of Falkenhayn's aides even jeered at soldiers shivering in the wintry conditions. It was a sad indication of Falkenhayn's relationship with his men and the remoteness of his staff from the troops on the ground. One German soldier expressed the feelings of the majority. Courage has nothing to do with it. The fear of death surpasses all other feelings and terrible compulsion alone drives the soldier forward. We are motivated to fight on by this damned discipline of the Prussian army and the simple feeling that the terrible must be done. They were no longer wildly enthusiastic about war. There was a strange sense of foreboding about the coming battle. Back at their respective headquarters, Falkenhayn was aware that his hour of destiny was calling. Patan, however, did not realize the role he would soon play in the great military clash. The dawn of February 21, 1916, brought fog to the French sector around Verdun. The stillness was suddenly shattered by a massive German bombardment. Falkenhayn's assault on the French army had begun. For nine terrifying hours, 1,220 German guns kept up a relentless barrage, obliterating the poorly prepared French frontline trenches and burying hundreds of men alive. The rain of gunfire fell most heavily on Colonel Driant's regiment. Driant was one of the first to acknowledge Verdun's vulnerability. His defenses were stronger than other French regiments in the line, but his men still suffered. At 4 p.m., the first waves of the German infantry attacked. As the German assault pressed on, the French line was in danger of buckling. A massive infantry assault following the attack would have certainly broken the French line. This was not what Erich von Falkenhayn had in mind. He did not want the French to withdraw, but to pour their troops into Verdun in order to destroy them. By the end of the first day, the German attack penetrated the French defenses up to two miles in some places. After another furious bombardment, the Germans attacked again on the morning of February 22nd. and deadly new weapon came with the forward lines of German assault troops, the flamethrower. They were used on the most stubborn French resistance. Under this renewed storm, the French line buckled again. In danger of being entirely cut off, Colonel Driant decided that the remnants of his regiment should withdraw before they were all slaughtered. As they retreated, Driant was mortally wounded. By now, entire French infantry battalions were disappearing in the smoke and fire of the German assault. Falkenhayn's plan to destroy the French army at Verdun seemed to be working. There appeared to be nothing that the French defenders could do to halt the relentless Germans. <laughs> 
French troops were being killed by their own artillery. German machine guns broke up many French counterattacks almost before they got underway. By the end of the fourth day, the Germans were closing in on the forts that protected Verdun. Their focus turned to the impenetrable Fort Douaumont. German assault pioneer Sergeant Kunze led the charge. On the morning of February 25th, Kunze led his assault group from the elite Brandenburg Regiment to the top of Fort Douaumont. They were blown off into a ditch below by a stray shell. Miraculously unharmed, he looked around for an opening and found one above him. Ordering his men to form a human pyramid, he broke into the fort. Entirely alone, he began to wander through this vast concrete labyrinth. He heard the muffled bangs of Fort Duamont's 155 millimeter gun. Guided by these, he nervously made his way to the turret. The French gun crew, caught unaware, became his prisoners. Kunze then continued through the corridors, armed only with a pistol. He began to realize that the fort was virtually unmanned. He eventually found the remainder of the garrison in the main dormitory, many still in bed. He simply locked them in the room, then called his own men into the fort. Sergeant Kunze had single-handedly captured Verdun's most prestigious bastion. France was stunned as Fort Douaumont surrendered. In Verdun, French troops streamed through the streets shouting, save yourselves. After five days of battle, Verdun appeared to be on the verge of being overwhelmed. France was facing its most critical point of the war. Senior French officers had neglected Verdun and were now paying the price. Joffre, the French commander-in-chief, knew that only one man could save Verdun, and perhaps France, in this crisis, General Henri Philippe Pétain. On February 25, 1916, the French commander-in-chief, Joseph Joffre, ordered Henri Pétain to take over the Verdun garrison. Patan's first task was to reassure his men that they would soon take control. From there, he worked tirelessly to contain, then defeat, the German assault. Patan's first orders were that Verdun was to be held at any cost and that the existing defenses and artillery strength must be improved immediately. Reinforcements began to pour into Verdun. Patan felt that sustained use of artillery would turn the tide. He began to deploy an increasing number of guns. 
Rattan's most powerful weapon was his mere presence. His encouraging phrase, they shall not pass, became immortal. Morale was revived overnight, and there was new steel in the Poilu's resolve to hold Verdun. French trucks began to bring a steady stream of supplies and reinforcements along the only route into Verdun, safe from German shellfire. It soon became known as the Sacred Road. During the first week of March alone, 190,000 men trudged along it on their way to the front line. Transporting trucks would pass every 14 seconds. Falkenhayn appeared to be achieving his aim of drawing the whole French army into the Verdun slaughterhouse. However, Patan was now planning a major firepower assault. Heavy artillery bombardments halted the Germans, and Falkenhayn reluctantly changed his mind. He finally granted Crown Prince Wilhelm his wish to extend the attack to the western side of the River Meuse. By March 8th, the Germans had carved out a holding position across the river. Another titanic struggle began. Both sides threw more men into this new cauldron. the French casualties mounted again. But Patan was also inflicting severe losses on the Germans. By April 1916, French counterattacks were better planned, fierce, and frequent. They pushed the Germans away from the gates of Verdun. The thunder of the guns never ceased. By May, Verdun had become a scene of carnage and horror. The battlefield was pulverized by the massed artillery of both sides. A French pilot flying above the torn landscape compared it to the humid skin of a monstrous toad. On the ground, soldier and writer Jacques Meyer described the real horror. Everywhere there were distended bodies that your feet sank into. The stench of death hung over the jumble of decaying corpses like some hellish perfume. Patan's artillery and infantry were beginning to gain the upper hand over Falkenhayn. Unlike his opponent, he continually relieved his men with fresh troops. The Germans, exhausted from prolonged combat, surrendered with greater frequency. 
Patan's inspiration had saved Verdun. In May 1916, he was promoted to make way for two more aggressive and ruthless men. They were General Robert Nivelle and General Charles Mangin, who was already known by his men as the Butcher. The battle would rage on, putting pressure on the British Army to attack earlier than planned on the Somme. By early July, the French had retaken some of the forts lost to the Germans at the beginning of the battle. The tide was turning at Verdun. The massive British offensive on the Somme, which opened on July 1st, successfully diverted Falkenhayn's attention from Verdun. He was forced to go completely on the defensive. He could not simultaneously attack the French and resist the remorseless British pressure on the Somme. Not only had Falkenhayn's policy of destroying the French army failed, it had also sapped the German army's strength. As a result, the French restored their original line by the end of 1916. Petain's army had delivered both Verdun and France from the jaws of defeat but the price had been very high. The French suffered 377,000 casualties. Forty percent of their troops were listed as dead or missing. The German losses were almost as high. During 1916, more than three quarters of France's soldiers had passed along the sacred road. Their experience would shape the character of the French army for years to come. Haunted by the horror, Patin wrote, the constant vision of death had penetrated the French soldier with a resignation that bordered on fatalism. The strain of Verdun and subsequent battles led to widespread mutinies in the French army during the spring of 1917. Once again, it was Patin who was called in to restore the army's shattered pride and confidence. Patan did not hesitate to speak directly to the soldiers to hear their grievances. By improving the quality of life of the Poilu through more frequent leaves and better recreational facilities, Patan was able to nurse the army back to health. Henri Patin emerged from the First World War as France's greatest hero. Just over 20 years later, in May 1940, he was called upon once more to save his country from ruin. But as leader of Vichy France, he made the fatal error of placating Hitler and the Nazis in an effort to minimize the suffering of the French people. Bertin's actions would bring about his disgrace at the end of World War II. He was tried by his countrymen and found guilty of treason. In 
Charles de Gaulle, who had served in Pétain's regiment before 1914, granted clemency, sparing him a death sentence. The former hero of France died a disgraced and broken man in 1951. General Erich von Falkenhayn was forced to resign in August 1916 after the costly failures of Verdun and the growing hostility to his leadership. He was replaced by Generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who had enjoyed considerable success on the Eastern Front. In September 1916, Romania joined the war on the Allied side and Falkenhayn was sent to crush this new threat, which he did with great ruthlessness. He was then sent to help the Turks recapture Mesopotamia. He tried to do the same in Palestine. Both missions were failures. Falkenhayn spent the last months of World War I commanding an army in the Baltic state of Lithuania. He died in 1922. The French writer Paul Valéry described the Verdun campaign as a kind of duel before the universe, a singular and symbolic journey. It had been a supreme test of willpower for the soldiers and their commanders on both sides. None who fought at Verdun would ever forget the experience. The two generals primarily responsible for fighting the battle were a contrast of character. The autocratic and aloof Erich von Falkenhayn was despised by his soldiers. The compassionate Henri-Philippe Pétain was his men's inspiration. Falkenhayn was determined to see Verdun become a symbol of hopeless French sacrifice. Pétain stepped in and frustrated Falkenhayn's plans. The sacrifice of both sides was horrific, in evidence today by the graves of those who fell at Verdun. The clash between Falkenhayn and Pétain was a grim, prolonged, and costly duel. It was one of history's most desperate battles.